uh, creating a texture is very simple. Uh, and, and the mapping of it and displacement mapping and reflectivity, it can get more advanced very quickly, but generally you don't have to worry too much about that. Go ahead and show you now. So here we have a very simple sample of our regular objects. Now, these have been turned down. There we are. And this is just a simple set of sample objects with uh, no textures. Now you can see this is just the furniture with no building. That just makes this a little faster for us. So we'll go ahead and select one of these objects. There we go. And now this is just a simple generic solid. So what we'll do is we'll make a simple texture. We'll just right click. It doesn't matter where in the resource browser you right click and we'll do new resource and we'll specify that we want to make a RenderWorks texture. And we'll just make something like a simple red plastic. Plastic, there's it. So when you're making a texture, which is just a resource. So now most people, when they go to texture now, they're like, okay, I have an image. And they go to the image fill and they apply it to the object and they wonder why it doesn't do anything. Image fills are only for 2D objects period. They are only for 2D. They only show up in top plan and elevation and annotations, which is a sort of fake 2D layer on top of a viewport. Don't use 2D images in 3D renders if you want anything to work uh, right. So in here, we'll edit the texture and we're going to pick a color to start with. This is the most simple kind of texturing. So by default, nothing will change here. A little preview image. I'll go ahead and make that a sphere so it's a little more obvious. By default, it's going to be white. I'm just going to go ahead and pick a color red lovely this just means that currently what i've done is i've basically made a 3d texture that is very very simple and if i were to apply this to one of these objects select the object and then uh, a lot of people don't notice this by the way i'll go ahead and cover it now when you have an object selected the texturing is still done in the object info palette it's just done in the rendering tab uh, as long as you have a renderworks module that will be there i believe if you don't have renderworks this will be here but none of these controls will exist but if you're watching this odds are you have renderworks Go ahead and click this, and we'll scroll through. And I have many textures in this file. I called this red plastic very simple. There we are. See, I had this disabled. There we go. And there's my lovely red texture. Now, uh, in a rendering mode, for instance, like we'll go ahead and we'll just do a simple uh, fast render works. This is going to be relatively simple. It's not going to reflect, it's not going to show anything, but you'll see the plastic chairs behind it. See how they're shiny? They've been given a reflectivity. Uh, ooh, that's fast, I don't want fast. Final quality render works, there. They've been given a reflectivity. Uh, they're going to actually, uh, so since they're sort of a warped, distorted surface, they'll reflect light, they'll reflect shadow a little better. It'll just look a little more appropriate. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't use a rendering mode, uh, you generally won't see reflectivity. Re uh, OpenGL shows transparency and it will show color, but it won't show objects shining off of each other. It's, Open, OpenGL is limited in that. If you need to see reflectivity, you have to use something like Final Quality Renderworks or a Renderworks style, which we'll get to in a bit. And here, we'll just let this go for just a moment. We'll do our indirect lighting. There, see it's red, but it's impossibly red. Like you would, if you looked at an object like this in real life and it looked like that, it would look very strange. You'd be confused. There's no reflectivity to it. You, there's no definition on the edges because it's just a, a solid impossible red. But you can see the green objects over here. They look a little more realistic because they have this sort of distorted shine to the surface, which is what you'd expect if you were looking at plastic. So to edit this, which we can just do right in the middle of the rendering, it doesn't mind. We'll change this and we'll go to reflectivity and we'll just choose very simply, we'll just choose plastic because we just want it to be shiny. So this will give it uh, a reflection and a little bit of what's called a bump. So you know how when you have like injection molded plastic, it's not perfectly shiny like polished chrome. It's a little bit uh, dotted. That's what this is. We'll hit okay to that. And then it will automatically, again, because of that default auto re-render process, It'll just start rendering this right away. It'll do the indirect lighting. While we're waiting for that, the other options here for transparency, that's if you want to do water or glass or something like that, we'll get into that in a moment. There's a couple different ways of doing transparency. What we've picked here is simple plastic. You can use plastic for uh, things that aren't plastic. Just because it says glass or it says water or it says plain doesn't mean you have to use it for the thing that we titled it for. That just gives you an idea of what it's doing. Uh, and you can see, and we did literally no work. All I did was change the color to red and then use the default plastic texture. It's going to give what's called a glow, which is 
uh, just sort of a little, you see how it has a little bit of a sheen now, you can sort of see a little bit of what's going on, and it's a little darker in the corners, but it's still not quite like this plastic over here, it's not very reflective. So even though we set plastic, it doesn't look exactly like what we want. We'll go ahead and edit that texture again. And in here, instead of plastic, we'll go ahead and use, oops, we'll go ahead and use mirror, because mirror will be a perfect one. And now you'll see this. This is what would happen if it could perfectly reflect light. It's reflecting the environment that it's in, which is in this case of this little ball, just a clear area. When you're using perfect mirrors, you need something for it to reflect. So if you're doing like a test render, you need other objects around it for it to reflect. If you don't build either a fake like box environment, or if you don't uh, have a whole model around it, like if we had the whole pavilion turned on, you won't see anything. Like a chrome object will either look solid black or solid white. It's just impossible. So instead of perfect mirror, which is almost nothing, there's almost no perfect mirror in nature, we'll turn that down to maybe 60. And here, we can make it tinted if we wanted to. It's very red at the moment, so this tint will not look very obvious. Uh, you would use color here if, for instance, you wanted it to reflect a color. Instead of it being that color, it's just in that reflection, it tints the things that are in that reflection, that color. Blurriness is very useful um, if you want to do something like frosted glass, but it is extremely, what we'll refer to a few times as expensive to render. Um, when you're doing blurriness, basically any time a photon from any light source in your document strikes that object, it's going to have to be bent slightly, not all in the same direction like uh, light or ice refracts or glass. Uh, blurriness is going to interrupt it, so it has to do that math every time, and it's going to be very slow. Normally, you don't want to have to deal with that, so if you do use blurriness, use it sparingly, and if you do use it, use it only in your final renderings. Do one check, and you can see now the reflectivity has been turned down, so it's not so strange. We'll hit OK. And now, 60% is still an extreme shine. Uh, normally, if you're doing something like plastic, you would turn it down to maybe like 10 or 20%. You really just want that gleam of objects coming off of it. We'll give it just a moment to render here. There's our OpenGL. It'll start loading, and then it'll start doing its indirect lighting. And see what we're doing now? If we had been doing those light objects earlier and waited for this to happen every time, we wouldn't be halfway through the video as we are. We wouldn't be anywhere close to now. OpenGL will save you a lot of time, but OpenGL cannot help you do texturing work. You need to use the RenderWorks modes, like Final Quality RenderWorks or a RenderWorks style, in order to do texturing work. It will not work otherwise. And actually, here we are. There you can see. It's still a bit too bright, and that's because we had the reflectivity way too high, but it almost looks like red chrome. It's very shiny, so we've turned that up. So we gave it a mirror, even though it isn't a mirror, and it looks a little more like plastic. It looks a little more colored. And the more eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that now it is many days later in a different time. Uh, that's because I wanted to add a little more about textures. I wanted to go in a little more and just explain the concepts behind them. Also, uh, what we were doing before was final quality render works, and that's not really necessary. Here, we'll go to something very quick. We'll just actually, we'll use fast. And you can see here, we can get this in just a couple seconds as opposed to having to wait about 30 seconds like we did last time. It should pop up quick and just give us, there we go. So see, this resolves pretty quickly. It's jagged around the edges, but this generally covers what we need to see. Uh, and I've noticed the reflections. Now, remember we were talking about environment reflections before? Here, let me show you something really, really obvious. Environment reflection. Keep an eye on this shininess going on around here. Also, when you have indirect lighting on, the pre-render looks cooler. There we go. So now see here, you get all this detail in an overly shiny texture like this. That's just another thing you can control with environment reflections. The environment reflections are turned on, but the actual environment itself is set to black, so you'll only see it in the reflective objects. Let's go over a little bit more of the, the basics of this kind of reflectivity, though. Uh, I'm going to set this inside object to a dark gray, I think. All right. Colors. There we are. We don't need a texture for that. Gray is fine. We just want to show some contrast between these two. So now, what we'll do is we'll just modify this texture slightly. So we'll go here in the resource browser. 
come down, it's going to be the big red one. Actually, we called it simple red, didn't we not? There we go. We'll edit this. And now we'll disable the reflectivity for the time being. Now these different these different options here are all called shaders, and in other rendering applications you would be able to apply a large number of them. In Vectorworks you're limited to one of each type. So for now, color is very simple. We're using the color of it. The other way of controlling it via color that is the default is object attribute, and this will use the default uh, fill color for the object we have selected. So this one currently is set to white, so if we hit OK to this, it'll reset that. But if we select this object, it's still using this texture. This texture is still being applied to this. If we simply change the fill color of it, it will change it here, and that will be used as the base for that texture. So any objects we apply this to, they'll use their object attribute. But generally, you don't want to do that. You normally want to control the texture directly, unless you're just trying to apply a shine to everything. So we'll use a specifically chosen color for this. And for the time being, we'll keep our red. Uh, we've covered reflectivity. There's a few other modes you can use for reflectivity. This one's a simple one. The mirror one is the basic one. Uh, but transparency is the one we'll cover next. And we'll, we'll isolate them so you can just see one component of that at a time. So the first thing we'll do is we will simply use a glass transparency. Now, glass in particular has a couple different attributes. The main thing is transmission. This is the overall transparency. This is how much light gets through the glass. If you ever need to know what any of these particular values are, you can just hover over them and a little uh, pop-up text like there is on every dialog will give you some info. But that's particularly useful when you're doing rendering. Don't need blurriness for now. And refraction, uh, we'll leave that at 1.0 so light won't be bent when it passes through the object. The color of the transparency is key. So actually, let's do this. We'll change the color of this. We'll set this to pure white. Now, we don't have to set that to pure white for this to work, but that will show you how we're controlling this. So now we want the color to stay white, but the absorption color to be red. And now if we hit OK, you're not going to see much here. See? There's no change in the color. What we did is we had it absorption. Absorption is... So if you ever look at a piece of glass that has different thicknesses across it, the thicker the glass is, the more red it would be if it was red, for instance, because there's more, there's just more density, there's more light, there's more red in there, so the more, the deeper it goes, the more light is going to refract back out red. But we want to do this, oh, I'm going to go ahead and guess 0.1, let's call it 1 inch, and hit OK. Now this preview will not give you a very accurate idea of how much, uh, absorption is going on because it's just a simple sphere object. It's not large. Hit OK. You can see how it's transparent here. But of course, uh, OpenGL can't do any transparent, uh, can't do any color calculations. So we'll go ahead and we'll use our fast render works. It's fine. Let that render up. And I suspect we'll get a little bit. See how it's deeper red in the crevices? How it's a light red out here, but it's a deeper red where it gets darker and it sort of flows naturally? That's absorption. So see how the underside of it is actually lighter because that's thinner glass. And as it gets thicker, it gets more dramatic. You can do a couple things with this. It's useful for if you need ice or smoke. Um, it's also useful for colored glass is the main reason you would use this. But you can also just use simple transparency. Like instead of glass, we can just use plain. And that just gives us an opacity value. So this is not complicated by any means. 90% will give us sort of a just a simple white object that's semi-transparent. In OpenGL, of course, it'll look a little strange, but once it renders. 90%, you can sort of see the ghosting through the object, but generally you want to go to at least 50% in order to get that. But this is just a plain transparency. However, plain transparency almost always looks wrong if you're going for photorealism. It, you'd almost always want something like, it would either be glass or water generally if it's that transparent uh, or something strange like smoke. You'll see in a moment, see how this doesn't quite make a lot of sense. You don't really see why this would be so transparent. There's almost no object in reality that's transparent and isn't either a gas or reflective on the outside. So for that, we'll go back in. We will give it some sort of a color because, again, having no color at all is a little strange to the eye. Give it a little purple there. Change this back to glass. And, of course, this has index of refraction. Turn that to 1.5. We'll do something nice like ice.
And it will also, uh, glass also has a default reflectivity to the outside skin of it, so it'll shine. There you go, you see that? You see that shininess. So it'll look like either tra like transparent acrylic or glass or plastic. That's generally what you can do with shaders like that. So just because we chose the glass one, and even though it's about 50% or 90% transparency, the plain transparency one didn't look right, but this glass one did. We'll go ahead and we'll edit this again. And keep in mind, what I'm doing here is just adjusting this texture a lot, and it's no longer red plastic very simple. It isn't that at all. So make sure you use some discipline with your names of your textures. So when you change it and you get it the way you want it, make sure you do a final edit to uh, the, the name that makes sense. Otherwise, you'll be left with red plastic simple that's just a translucent glass blue, which is not what you're going for at all. Now we'll go to bump, and we'll cover uh, more about bump in a little bit, but I just want to show you the basics of it. So we'll start with something like noise. See how it's a little wobbly? You can choose different kinds of noise. And we, we have a uh, chart that explains what a lot of this is later. And these are what are called procedurally generated. So these patterns don't duplicate. So you know how we were um, looking at a few of the brick textures earlier and they had a, a repetition to them? These won't have that. So for instance, I'll make this glass again. Okay. And I'll let this render update. And this might be strong enough for you to see. I might have to turn it higher in order for it to be obvious. No, we'll turn that a little higher, I think. We're going to make this particularly strong. Bump strength is 100. Now, this is so you can control the actual size of it. Uh, that's irrelevant when you're doing something. Uh, when This is sort of an amorphous shape, the cell one, so it's not super important that you get it right. Uh, this changes how it's applied to the object. So if it's a 3D, if it's a, a spherical object, like, like the strange shape we're using here, generally you want 3D solid, or if it has a depth to it, you'll want solid. Uh, if it is a flat object, or like a flat plane of glass, or even, even a curved pane of glass, 2D wrapped can sometimes behave a little better. You can change those uh, to see which one you want. And this is displacement mapping, which we'll go into detail in just a bit. A displacement mapping actually generates physical geometry higher or lower than the original. I think, let's actually go with something a little more strange. There we go. That should be a little more obvious, I think. Make it a little less transparent. There we go. Now you can see it. This sort of strange pattern applies to it. Now these are... The noises are, are a very artistic option. A lot of the time, they'll just be used to delineate different types of material. Uh, they won't, they don't always emulate something exactly. If you want to emulate something like tile or brick, there's the tile or brick shaders, which are in there as well as uh, noise. The noise shaders are just something that come with the rendering engine and they give you a little uh, surface control without doing too much effort. However, I think this rendering mode might be a little too low to really see what this one's doing. Yeah, we'll go to something different. So in here, instead of this texture, what we'll apply now is there's a few textures in here that are pre-prepared with displacement mapping applied to them. And again, like the uh, textures mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of objects loaded into here that you'll be able to use. Actually, these aren't the ones I want. I want the texture object. Files are actually in here. So we'll use one that's just uh, very obvious. So we're going to take this uh, this thing skin because it's very easy to see what it's doing here. And the uh, displacement map, which is what we use for it, is relatively obvious. So we'll change our resource browser. And this is how you import a texture if you weren't aware. We'll switch back over to our pavilion file. And we still have this file. Uh, we still have the texture object file lit up. And we're just going to import that. What did I call that texture? Thing skin. Import. Go back to our document. apply the thing skin to this object. There we are. That'll re-render, but first, uh, now final quality render work will not show displacement. So if we were to wait right now, it would look just about like that, just in final quality. See how it just has these lines? That's because we're in fast render work, so it's not gonna use displacement mapping at all. What I want to show you in here is how the displacement mapping is actually achieved. We're not going to go step by step. Uh, I'll probably make more videos later that explain specifically how to build this from a library uh, of images. But And of course, you see how this is this object is too large. There we are. So 
we have our lines and we have our displacement mapping, but this is the key. So when you go into the actual color, so in here there's an image color. This is the color I've applied to it. This is the image fill. So if I didn't use a filter, if I didn't apply a color to it at all, there's no filter to this color, it would just be black and white. This one is designed so that you can make this this thing texture or this mud, whatever color you'd like it to be. I'm gonna make that one meter so you can see it. There we are. So now you can see this texture just has white areas and black. And so in the displacement map, which is the same as a bump, remember before we were looking at the different uh, noise textures, they had a displacement to them. That's down here in the bottom. This is the displacement map itself. Black parts in a displacement map image will be all the way down. So they'll be closest to the object. The light parts or white will be the closest to the top. So if you get gray or, or gradients of objects, they'll sort of slope or lump. They'll be a little bumpy. And then in the color, we can control with whatever color we'd like to pick. So we can simply just pick gray for this. And it'll transfer this. So we don't actually edit the image itself. We're just applying a color over top of it. So that's simple enough. And then we will render this in a mode that will show displacement mapping, which I believe grass render will do. Nope, grass doesn't have that turned on. So we'll go ahead and edit it. And again, we'll get into this a little more too in just a bit. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go into our actual rendering style for grass and we will edit it such that it also applies displacement mapping. If you don't have this turned on, you won't see it. So fast, final, OpenGL, they won't show displacement mapping. You have to have a render work style that has this turned on. We'll enable that. That'll trigger the re-render. And we should see some bumpiness occur. However, it looks like we have significant bumpiness. So this was scaled up entirely too high. This is way too large. This is the, the, the displacement is entirely too high. So we're gonna go through and we'll edit the texture, most likely because I imported it from the other document. Oops. Because I imported this from the other document, uh, the other document might have had different scaling or the object might have been scaled to a different size in that view. So we'll go ahead and we'll just edit this texture overall and shrink it down. Find our thing skin. And we'll make it smaller. This is how much bump is going to happen, but uh, this is 0.2 meters. That's a bit small. So make it about half the size, hit OK, and we'll let that refresh again. Now, displacement mapping is, again, a very, very expensive rendering option. You don't want to use it unless. You don't want to use it unless you're ready to use it. So that huge texture displacement that we just saw a moment ago, this is being handled okay by this rendering mode. But again, this is way too large. So most likely, even though we made it smaller, do you see how we made the line smaller? So if we go to OpenGL, you can see the texture looks right. It is about the right size. It has the small bits, but those are huge. That means that the displacement value, the actual displacement value for the texture was too high. So see, this is displacing a very large amount. So we'll make that a tenth of what it was currently. Bring that down. Hit OK. Let this re-render again. Much smaller. Still huge, but much smaller than it was before. So now you can actually see it contouring to the object itself. Now this grass render mode I think is a little too low for us to see the detail. So what we'll do is we'll go in here again, we'll go to the render work styles, we'll find our grass render. And what you're seeing here, this is called aliasing. So this is just the lines, this is the, uh, the lighting. And we will enable a little bit more anti-aliasing. We don't need that many reflections. And we'll actually use anti-aliasing. So we're not using it at all here. That's why that was so low. Turn that back on. Now, this will increase the length, of course, of the render. We turn the quality up, we're going to have to pay for it in time. So it's not going to be as fast as it was a moment ago, but it'll give us a little more detail. And when you're doing renders like this, sometimes you need to turn the detail up in order to even see what you're actually using. So this should resolve a little more than it did a moment ago and get a little, a little more detail than we had. There we go. See it coming in now. And you can see this gives us a sort of our stone skin. And actually, 
I'm going to interrupt the render and just get real close to this object so you can see the detail. There we go. I'll let that render now. So this is a displacement map. And uh, in the uh, texture file, there's a few more of these that are already pre-prepared and pre-scaled to the object, but that's what you'll need to do to control it. You'll both change the size of the texture, which changes the size of the image or the overall size it's based on, and change how far it's displacing. So if we didn't want these crevices to be this deep, if we wanted these to be a little more shallow, we would reduce the displacement value, not the, just the size of the texture. Those values work independently. So they, and they don't scale just because they're both on the same texture. So if you bring an object in, or a texture in like I just did, I imported that texture. If you bring it in and you apply it to an object that's too small or too large, and you just change the size of the, the base image, it won't look right because as we saw, it stuck the rock of this particular texture out way too far. It stuck it in, extreme, in the extreme. It doesn't scale with the image size. So you have to remember to change that as well. Uh, another reason you want to remember to change that is if you don't, you will have to wait significantly longer because the higher a displacement value for displacement Mac textures, the more geometry it has to generate, so the longer it takes. And you can see we're getting a pretty cool surface effect here. Now, this is a, a pretty artistic type of surface array, uh, uh, surface displacement. You don't need to use this on every single object, but it's very cool when you're doing your final rendering to have things like fur or uh, like caked mud or rock like this especially to exterior renders, it can look really nice. It's not something you'll want to do over and over and over again in every single construction drawing or something like that, but it just gives it a nice finish. And knowing how to control it, you might as well. I mean, that's the point of RenderWorks.